Welcome to CivilNet. My guest today is Lawrence Bruce, Associate Fellow at Chatham House and expert on the South Caucasus. Um, he has joined us to give us his take on the current offensive in Nagorno-Karabakh. So on September 27, Azerbaijan launched an artillery offensive along the entire line of contact between Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh, including on the capital of Stepanakert and other residential areas. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brewers. Thank you for inviting me. So um, we will start with a general question. What is your general assessment on the current situation in Nagorno-Karabakh? Are these clashes evidence of the failure of talks? Uh, well, I, I think we're in a very dangerous uh, situation. Um, this appears to be a larger scale uh, escalation than in April 2016. Uh, we don't really have a clear sense yet of the casualties, but they look as if they're going to be higher. Um, there have been unsubstantiated reports uh, of territories uh, changing hands. Uh, so it, it's very difficult to assess right now what the full implications are. But as I see it, uh, the real danger is that we tip over beyond a four or five day war into something more protracted uh, and much more dangerous that could bring in uh, outside actors in ways that we haven't seen before. All right, so um, you mentioned uh, the four, day, uh, four days war of 2016. So this is, as you said, considered the fiercest clashes uh, compared to since 2016. And if we talk about this, you talked about that and the four day war and you said that this war was arguably a tactical su success for uh, Azerbaijan and was framed in the country as a turning on the tide moment justifying billions spent on defense. On defense. Are we currently in the same situation or the scenario is very much different? Well, I mean, I think uh, at the time of the April 2016 escalation, there was a narrative that was established that, uh, yes, this was a, a turning of the tide moment. It was the first military success. Uh, for the Azerbaijani army since the 90s, the first time that the territory changed hands. And I think it, it has created pressure to keep up that narrative. Uh, we saw the escalation in July 2020 uh, of this year, uh, which uh, didn't go uh, well for, for Azerbaijan. The losses were heavier uh, on, on the Azerbaijani side. And so uh, I'm sure that there is pressure uh, uh, in Azerbaijan to, to sustain uh, the narrative of military success. Uh, and of course, um, there was a protest, an unprecedented protest uh, in July uh, in Baku. Um, and that expresses the, uh, the popularity, in a sense, of military action. Uh, I think we need to recognize the frustration uh, that is felt in Azerbaijan with the situation, uh, a, a negotiations process that doesn't seem to have any momentum. Uh, and the feeling that uh, there is no other option uh, to, to create leverage except through the use uh, of force. So we know that uh, Turkey in general is a traditional backer of Azerbaijan when clashes begin between, um, when it happens between Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. What makes the involvement of Turkey different this time? Because we can notice that they, are, they seem to be more, Turkey seems to be more active uh, uh, in this situation, would you say that there is something has changed for Turkey and its position in some way? Yes, I mean, I, I think Turkish support obviously has always been there in terms of expressing solidarity and empathy uh, for Azerbaijan, but that has become more explicit. Uh, we saw high level visits uh, between defense officials of the two countries um, in July. Uh, and again, uh, we're seeing very explicit support, uh, diplomatic support uh, this time around. Um, but what we're also seeing are reports of the use of Turkish uh, drone technology. And there are unconfirmed reports uh, that there are mercenaries uh, uh, in, in the combat zone. Um, those are unsubstantiated reports uh, as yet. Um, but it seems to me that you know, what, what we're seeing effectively is perhaps the movement of the resolution process, the settlement process, out of a Euro-Atlantic framework and into a framework of regional powers, uh, where the, the two principal parties, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, will become more reliant uh, on security partners, uh, Russia uh, and Turkey. Uh, and I think a key implication of that is that they will have less influence uh, over the settlement process uh, than they did before. So, uh, yes, uh, more explicit Turkish uh, input, 
Um, I don't think that's going to lead to you know, open conflict between Russian uh, and Turkish forces. Um, it will be more uh, capability where there is still an element uh, of plausible deniability uh, for, for the Turkish side. All right, and, and uh, we talked about Russia, you just talked about Russia, and Russia, for example, uh, called on the parties to immediately stop hostilities and to return to the negotiation table, right? Um, but at the same time, Russia noticed that Turkey is more active. How does Russia, according to you, or from what you heard, I guess you analyze all that, perceive this active involvement of Turkey? Maybe not like a confrontation, but how, how, do, how does Russia perceive that? Uh, well, uh, Turkey's increased involvement is is challenging uh, the the status quo and the kind of the security balance that's existed and, and kind of held uh, the peace, however imperfectly, uh, over the last 15 years or so. Um, I mean, I think here, uh, you know, Azerbaijan is a small state, uh, even if it's bigger than Armenia, it faces uh, Russian security guarantees uh, to Armenia. Um, and uh, a lot of uncertainty over how Russia would act in the event of a full-scale war. And that has encouraged a, a cautious approach uh, with regard to the use of force uh, overall from Azerbaijan. But Turkey's increased involvement kind of challenges that and uh, reduces the risk of being isolated uh, in the event uh, of a larger-scale conflict. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think Russia you know, sees greater Turkish involvement uh, as a challenge. Um, and uh, it will be a, a real test, I think, of Russia's influence uh, over both parties and over the mediation process, whether it will, as it has before, uh, negotiated a rapid ceasefire that underlines and affirms uh, its own influence. Um, according to you, in your opinion, will the situation escalate more? I know it's uh, maybe a little bit early to say that no one really knows about this, but uh, since how it goes and then the, the clashes are ongoing right now and they've been spreading uh, the border. So uh, do you think that it will escalate or will we go back Armenia and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean not Nagorno-Karabakh, but Armenia and Azerbaijan will go back to, to the negotiation table and if so, will they start new negotiations from scratch or they will continue what they already uh, started way before, years before? Well, of course, a lot depends on the scenarios of the next few days. Um, if there is essentially an inconclusive military interaction, uh, it could be that both sides are then able in different ways to frame uh, this conflict as a success uh, and then to go back to the negotiation table uh, and basically return to the tr traditional pattern. Um, that would be returning, uh, I think, to a dysfunctional uh, peace process in many ways. And what we would need uh, is much more uh, commitment uh, and attention uh, to the process from international actors. If uh, Azerbaijan is successful in recouping uh, substantial areas uh, of territory, uh, there may again be a return to a ceasefire, but Azerbaijan's position would be strengthened. Armenia's position could be weakened and making it more dependent on Russia uh, in, in the future. Um, you know, the, the nuclear option for Armenia would be to recognize uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Um, I think that would really be a last resort um, because uh, uh, that would preempt the result of the Minsk process um, and we would lose the Minsk process uh, in, as we know it. Uh, the other scenario is that Armenian counterattacks are successful uh, and inflict very heavy losses on Azerbaijan, precipitating uh, a domestic crisis uh, inside Azerbaijan. And in that scenario, I think you know there would be difficult choices for for Turkey whether to uh, increase its level of support, uh, what to do uh, with that relationship uh, in, in in that scenario. So very hard to predict at this stage. Um, what happened in April 2016 was essentially an inconclusive. Uh, interaction. Strategically, nothing changed. And it may be uh, that that happens again. The key, though, is that we need much more uh, attention and coordination uh, of the mediation process. There are some things that sometimes can hint that the situation is worse than before. And this is also the media coverage outside of the Caucasus in general. And compared to 2016, April 2016, we can notice that 
the media coverage in Europe or even in the US is larger than it was back in time. Do you think it's also an indicator of, um, of a very much worse situation? And in that sense, why, is, uh, why are European countries or Western countries more uh, interested in this conflict this time? Well, I, it may be because, you know, we've had an escalation in July. Uh, we've had an, we're having another one now. This is becoming a, a regular uh, occurrence. Um, I, I do think that the situation is, is more serious and more grave uh, than it has been in the past uh, because of the, the, the global context. Uh, you know, the world is, is very distracted uh, with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, with the U.S. elections, with Donald Trump's tax, tax returns. Um, it's a, a, a moment in which uh, it's a very difficult moment for, for multilateralism and for that the liberal democratic order uh, on which uh, the Minsk process was itself founded back uh, in the 1990s. So uh, it's a good thing if there's increased international attention. Uh, we should also remember that uh, a number of countries saw diasporic communities fighting in the streets uh, in, in July. And it may be that this conflict is assuming a higher profile because of that. Thank you, Dr. Burrs, for this talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching and continue to follow CivilNet to get the latest updates.